going to happen. Now it happens because of God's great love. And missions exist because worship does not exist. The ultimate goal of missions is that Christ will be glorified. And people would magnify him and they would receive the good blessing and the good news in eternal life that is only found in Christ Jesus. That's why we go, that's why we send, that's why we sacrifice, that's why we give, because people matter to God. And the gospel changes people. This congregation in so many ways is generous Generous in funds, generous in times of prayer, generous in sending people. And missions is a part of our DNA, and it is a thrust forward in our mission statement, which is intentional. We exist to bring about the obedience of faith in this place and throughout the world for the sake of his name among all the nations. And so, if you are a part of this congregation, this is a part of who we are because it's a part of God's heart. And so we want to join with him in what he is doing. And so what you do, what you say, how you give, how you live, matters. This morning we are continuing in our series on prayer. This is the last message on it you'll hear from me in this series. Next week, by the way, Lee Eklav will be speaking. He will continue. He's going to go to Revelation. After that, our own Michael Allen is going to be bringing the word to us. I am excited and encouraged that last Monday we had 14 or so people praying in our prayer room, praying for this congregation, praying for our community. I encourage you to be a part of that. There's more people praying today at 9 o'clock, and you have been prayed for today. Encouraged by this. And I want us to recognize that as we see the gospel communicated to the ends of the world, it is fueled by love, and it is uh, sent forward through prayer. Prayer matters. If you have not gotten that over this series, I will continue to pray for you That you would understand this. Prayer changes things. You matter when you pray and engage in what God, God is doing. It matters. And it's exciting and being encouraged by what God is doing, not just in this room, but throughout the world. And my prayer is, hope is, that we would see together what God is doing and participate until we see him face to face. My Redeemer will again stand on the earth. And may we stand with him, not just that day, but in every day and in every way. Well, the topic for this morning is another component of prayer. And the title is Praying in the Battle, or the Subject of Spiritual Warfare. Now, some churches um, really focus on this heavily, while other churches really don't talk about this reality at all. And I want us as a church to understand, as a biblical foundation, that there indeed are supernatural beings If you go just quickly through the Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you will see these beings mentioned, angels in their various forms. And I just did a quick search in my concordance, and angels are mentioned in the Bible 295 times. That's a lot of times. On the other side of the equation, there are supernatural angels. These were angels that were um, created as angels, and they are fallen angels. The head of this group being called the devil, or Satan, or Lucifer, or the evil one. Many names. There are many significant references to this group of supernatural beings as well. 179 times. Jesus himself talked about these beings repeatedly. And if you remember in the prayer that he taught us to pray, even in those words, we're told to ask our Father to deliver us from the evil 
one. This is a biblical, spiritual reality. These beings continue to work, both for good and evil, even to this very moment. We are to be aware of these things because Scripture makes us aware of these things and has lots to talk about. And this sermon literally could be a series, and perhaps someday we'll we'll focus more on the various nuances when it comes to what is happening spiritually, supernaturally, that has effects physically on this planet. If you are a believer of the Bible, you have to understand that these beings do exist. Hebrews chapter 13 reminds us that we are to entertain or provide hospitality to strangers. And some of us unknowingly have entertained or interacted with angels, but not being aware of it. Side note... There's only a few, um, there's only one category of angel that has wings. By the way, most angels don't have wings, okay? I'm going to let you know that. If someone walked in here with a set of wings, you would know it's an angel, right? They look like people, but they are not people. And by the way, (laughs) when you die, you do not become an angel, okay? As someone who knows the Bible, it grates me when people say, heaven received another angel when their loved one died. No, it didn't. Okay, It received a person, not an angel. Angels were created at one time. They do not propagate other little baby angels. Okay, Angels are angels. Demons are demons. God is God, and people are people. Okay, (laughs) Let's get that out of the way. You guys are like, dude. (laughs) It's going to be a long sermon. I'm already straying. Okay. (laughs) Let's get back. (laughs) So, today we're going to focus on one primary passage. And again, there are many passages that deal with this subject. And by the way, there's many books and many good resources. There's many bad resources, but there's many good resources, commentaries, Bible scholars, people who understand these things that are out there. Okay, so if you are curious about this subject, there are many things written, and I have probably 20 or so books on the subject just myself. It is a massive subject. But we are going to look at just one passage. And this is Ephesians. And this is the classic passage when it comes to spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. I'll have it here on the screens. And I typically use the NIV or ESV version. Today it is NIV. Now Paul, after he had instructed this Church And as he is instructing this church in Ephesus, he is instructing this church in Rockford. He's speaking um, to them, and he also is speaking to us. The book of Ephesians is one of high theology and practical application. And if you have read through that book, and I encourage you to read through that book as you are reading through the Bible... You'll see all of these things. And near the end, now Paul focuses in on, and these people were very beloved of him, some final instructions for them and some important instructions for us. So as we look at this passage, I'm just going to highlight four things. And I try to make them actionable, that you can put them into practice. Some things we are doing, some things it's important for us to know. We are knowing. And hopefully you will uh, see these things along with me as we go through this passage today. The first primary point is this. Number one, be strong in the Lord. That's the first thing. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Here we go. Finally, be strong in the Lord. And be strong in his mighty power. That is the first thing when it comes to supernatural warfare. 
Number one is to be strong in the Lord. That's first. What does that mean? What it doesn't mean is that you and I have to be physically strong. Aren't you grateful for that, right? God doesn't say in order to go into warfare, you better hit the weights, Jack, right? This is warfare that happens on a supernatural level. And it requires supernatural weapons, and we will get into that. It says that we are to be strong in the Lord, that is Jesus Christ. So the number one thing you and I must do as Christians engaging in spiritual warfare is to be strong in Jesus. That you know Him, worship Him, love Him, follow Him, serve Him, abandon yourself to Him. Understand what is true about Christ. Read the Gospels. Read the letters after the Gospels that described Christ. Read the Old Testament looking for Christ because He is everywhere. If you get anything in theology, understand the identity of who Jesus is. That is primary, your relationship with him, that your understanding is strong and that your relationship with Christ is ongoing and steadfast. So first, as we are engaging in this world and we recognize that there are supernatural beings that are warring with each other and looking to either free us or capture us. First thing we are to do as a church, being strong in the Lord. Paramount, foundational, central to your Christianity is Christ. No, Christ. No, Christ. No, Christ. More than you know about the end times, more than you know about the origins, more than you know about theology, know Christ. Hear me. Be strong in the Lord. And second, coupled with that, that we are to be strong, as this, this sentence is put together, in His mighty power. Before Christ sent us out, it's called the Great Commission, found in the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Therefore, go and make disciples. Remember that? Right before that section, he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Don't skip over that significant statement by Christ. All authority. Authority in both heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is what Jesus said. And so we are first strong in the Lord, and then we are to be strong in His mighty power. Demons do not tremble at your name, but they do tremble at His. Every knee bows to his name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. His name is greater, has more authority, carries more weight than any name of anything that has been named. His might. Now that helps me when I engage in spiritual warfare. And I have. And I have seen things that will make milk curdle. <laughs> seen things that I wish I wouldn't have seen. In those instances, and when you are facing a demonic power, 
our strength doesn't come from our righteousness, but from His. Our authority doesn't come because of who we are. It comes from who He is. Understand this. The might we carry is the might that is delegated to us from the mighty, almighty one. Do you understand that? Greater is he who is in me, greater is he who is in you, than he who is in the world. And so when we engage in supernatural, spiritual warfare, we do so being strong in Christ, and we do so by being strong in His mighty power. Remember that. It's not how godly you are, it's how godly and how great He is. That should help you in confidence when we engage with supernatural enemies that are active and working here in modern day America and throughout the world. First, understand where your courage can come from and where your confidence is. It's in Christ and the might of His power. And it is a great power indeed. Second thing that Paul brings to us, and this is what I want you to know. No, you have supernatural enemies. This should be obvious at this point, but I want to bring it to the forefront. Verse 11 of Ephesians 6, Paul instructs us to put on the full armor of God. So that, and we'll talk about this armor and describes it in just a couple verses. We put this armor on. Why? So that you can take your stand. Underline that. You're going to see this word. Stand, 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 stand firm. Okay? We are given this thing so that we can stand our ground. Against what? Well, against the devil's Schemes, okay? Methods, plans, right? It's not necessarily against the devil. He is like a figurehead. Is he a being that exists? Absolutely. But he is like a general of a supernatural army. He coordinates the plans. This is how we're going to work. And by the way, he, he thinks for the long term, this is how we're going to work generationally. This is how we're going to work situationally. This is how we're going to work around the world. And he has plans. He is a planner. He is a schemer. And so we are to put on this armor so that we can stand our ground against the devil's schemes. Verse 12. For our struggle, and we, at times, we all struggle. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our primary struggle is not against flesh and blood people. Let me say that again. I want this to sink into your thinking. Your enemy, my enemy, enemy is not flesh and blood people. We often think that way, that my enemy is my co-worker, or my enemy is the president, or the system, or your mother-in-law.
And we fight against the person, but you're fighting the wrong person. Paul tries to make this clear. And those living in Ephesus, and makes that clear, those living in this region of Rockford. Don't confuse false enemies for real ones. People are the prize, and people often are pawns of the real puppet master. Understand this. When you are praying for people, you can pray against the enemy. And some people willingly engage in his schemes. Some people are caught up in his lies. Some people are unaware of what's going on, but it is raging. There is a eternal, cosmic struggle that had commenced before we were ever on this planet, by the way. And God hates Christians. I'm going to add that in. Why? Because, did I say God hates Christians? Wow, let's strike that. Woo! Came out of my mouth, and I'm like evaluating the other part of my brain. What did you just say? That was perfectly incorrect. Okay. Let's, re- let's rewind. <laughs> People are like, amen. Well, wait a second, what did I just say? No. <laughs> the devil <laughs> hates Christians. That's what I meant to say. Thank you, thank you. I got it right. I need help, believe me. (laughs) The devil hates Christians. Why does the devil hate Christians in particular? (laughs) Because he hates God. And God loves his people. And God's spirit is in you and me. And the devil wanting to ultimately get After God, he goes after what he loves, which is you and me. Does that make sense? If you want to hurt me the most, go after the people that I love. My wife, my children, y'all. It hurts. Understand this. There are rulers, authorities, powers of the dark world, and people have, you know, parsed these and said this is that, and there's different um, hierarchies, and I can see that, right? But these things are fighting against God, and therefore fighting against what God loves, and therefore fighting against You and I, in particular, the gospel, to reach places that not have been reached yet. Understand this. We are eternal beings. They are eternal beings. We are on the battleground. We are here, a part of this battle, and I want you to understand this. No, you have supernatural enemies. Coupled with that, Paul and the Holy Spirit want us to know that we are to know we have supernatural power. So we have a supernatural enemy, but we have been given supernatural power power to combat this supernatural enemy. He goes on. Verse 13, just the first little portion. Therefore, therefore, knowing that we are to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, 
Therefore, knowing that we are to put on the full armor of God because there are principalities and authorities and rulers and evil forces warring, knowing all this, therefore, put on the full armor of God. If you were going into a literal battle, you would be, you would be very sure that you had on your equipment. You would make sure that you had on the bar body armor. You would make sure that you had your weapon and it was working well. You would make sure that you had these because your life depended upon it. People going into battle, they check their equipment time and time and time and time again because their life depends upon it, because they're going into hostile environments. Often, you and I forget that when we get up in the morning, right? La da 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 da. Christians don't get up in the morning going to the playground, they get up going to the battleground. The enemy doesn't want you to remember that. Because he doesn't want you to be equipped. Because the more vulnerable you are, the more successful he is. Do you understand this? And it is crazy for me to think that we as Christians, and often the Christian church in particular, in the West, which is America and cushy places in the world to live. By the way, we live in a very comfortable country, right? You have air conditioning, enough said, right? You're in the minority of the world, by the way. We live in the minority world. The rest of the world is majority. And often we get lulled to sleep because we're so comfortable. Overly entertained. Overly indulged. By the way, some of the poorest people in America are some of the richest people in other countries. Let that sick in. Therefore, put on the full armor of God like a soldier going into battle. And he talks about what this is. And he talks about how important it is. Put on the full armor of God. So that the last point, that you stand your ground. Stand your ground. Verse 13, second portion, he says... Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that, this is why we do that, not so that we'll have a good day, right? so that things go with you, so well with you. It says, so that when, not if, when the day of evil comes. And there is a day and there are days of evil. We put this on so that you may be able to stand your ground, underlined that the second time we've heard this, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. You see the emphasis here? Standing, ready, alert, as a soldier in battle, unmoving, on guard, ready to remain in guard 
the territory that has been taken step by step. The enemy wants to retake land that God has, places, people in particular. We are to put these things on so that we stand firm in the faith, stand with Christ back in the beginning, right? We stand in Him, not moving an inch from the faith that has been passed down to you. And many people have fallen because they have gotten lazy and they have not known Christ and they've been wooed away by other philosophies, other thoughts, other opinions and positions, and it happens. We are to stand firm. How? With. The belt of truth, and these have been sermons and they're out there, but understand generally what this is. Stand with the belt of truth. This is not your truth. This is God's truth, the truth that does not change. The one who is the truth. We stand in the truth of Scripture, buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. It is living righteous within the righteousness of Christ. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now in addition to all of this, take up two things, the shield of faith which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows lit by the fire of hell, shot out by the evil one. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Armor is something that you live within. Soldiers don't take their armor and chuck it at the enemy. Armor by itself does you no good. We have a responsibility to live within these things. Now hear me. We pray that we will be not influenced into temptation by the evil one and his influence upon our mind, our thinking, our families, our body, our emotions. He wants to rob, kill, steal, and destroy, right? Not your friend, even though being the father of lies, he pretends that he is. And people think that his philosophy, ph- philosophies are good for them, and in the end it destroys them. The enemy, by the way, is a very good fisherman. And I used this illustration in the past. James, the half-brother of Jesus, by the way, grew up with him, son of Mary and Jer- Joseph, who became a believer and a foundational person of the church. He says that we are tempted when we are enticed and lured away. The devil's a fisherman, by the way. Trying, and you're a good fisherman, right? If you're a good fisherman, you disguise the hooks in a piece of bait. He does that all the time. Hey, look, I got something good for you, yo. You are going to like this. And you know the bait that you typically chomp on that drags you to places you don't want to go. Hear me? Disguises it. We are to live understanding the truth.
truth, our mind, knowing that we are saved by what Christ has done in our faith in Him. Letting that protect us as thoughts try to bombard our thinking. Living righteously protects you. Someone say amen. Right? Protects you physically, we know that. <laughs> I am not in any danger of getting a sexually transmitted disease because I don't sleep around. I have a wife, and yes, we are together. That's protection. I, if I lived unrighteously, I would put this thing down, and I would be not just vulnerable for that, but many other things as well. You understand living as a Christian protects you? You understand that? Walking in truth, telling the truth, living the truth protects you. Living righteously protects you. When we don't, we're vulnerable. You as a Christian have a target on your back. You understand that. The enemy is not your friend. He is ruthless. He will try to take advantage of anything he can to destroy you and pull you away. He hates you because he hates God. And so I want you to understand when we give the enemy a, a foothold by participating in sin, by going outside of God's good protection, we become vulnerable. I want you to understand that. Sin hurts us and those often we love and those in society and if you carry the name of Christ, his heart as well. So we are given these things so that we stand. Understanding our footing of the, what the gospel is. And people get dragged away from Christ because they don't know the gospel. My hope would be if I took a microphone around and said, tell me the gospel. You'd be able to tell it to me. Understand who Christ is is and so these things are given to us so that we can stand we have faith and you will get shot at right? and people have pointed this out the only offensive weapon in our arsenal is the word of god that's why i, I <laughs> Encourage you. I want to say harp on you. <laughs> Encourage you strongly to know the word of God because it will protect you and it will vanquish the evil one. Right? Remember when Christ interacted with the devil? Remember that <clears throat> the devil took scripture and twisted it to say something that it didn't mean? That was his first thing. And by the way, he does that today. I can give you book after book after book who ju that justify sin by twisting the words of Scripture. Are you hearing me? And people gulp it up. Unfortunately, people in my youth group who heard me speak <laughs> in churches I have pastored, fell for it and fall for it because they just take it in and, oh yeah, well, it's okay to live any way you want and any lifestyle you want. Here's a book to prove it, and here's another one on top of it. Here, Pastor, read this, and I have read it. And it's trash. 
Why? It's a twisting of Scripture. You know how Jesus himself battled <laughs> the devil who used Scripture, by the way? With Scripture? You say this to mean one thing, but actually based on this Scripture, it does not and cannot mean, mean that thing. This is why knowing your Bible and have your Bible knowing you matters. That's why God gives the church, and that's, <laughs> that's one of the privileges I have to study this thing all the time. <laughs> to help us when we don't know. Say, hey, pastor, will you help me? Elders, will you help me? Friend who knows the word, will you help me? gift. The word matters, and it is your offensive weapon. And if you have faith, it is a good thing, but you are not going to take any ground if you do not know the word of God. Are you hearing me? Come on, hear me. Hear me, hear me, hear me. I can't read the Bible for you. I can read it to you. But I can't make you believe. You have to choose that. The Holy Spirit Helps us this way. So we pray these things, yes, but we live them. You're doing no good if you pray on the armor in the morning and don't tell the truth in the afternoon. It's living in it, right? You understand this? Doesn't some for form of Christian witchcraft... Hey, how do you like that phrase, right? Well, I'm just going to pray this on, and then I'm impenetrable. If you're lying or engaging in unrighteous behavior, or if you're believing things that aren't true, you're penetrable. You're vulnerable. <laughs> you toast, friend. I love you. That's why I'm saying this, okay? You can understand the passion in my voice. I care about you. I care about Christ. So don't be surprised. <laughs> if there is a battle, because there is, and may God open our eyes to this. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 10. But they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion. This is where the battle has happens. Arguments, lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. And our world is ripe with this stuff. And take every thought captive to obedience to Christ. How does this thought, this argument line up with Christ. Make it captive so that people can go free. Do you understand that? Coming to a conclusion, and we're going to transition to communion. So in conclusion, okay, and there's lots more we can talk about here. Lots of stories I can tell. Giving us the foundation want you to remember that the power of God is greater than the power of the evil one. Okay. Stand your ground. Give yourself to living in what our Father has given us. The only way to stop spiritual enemies is with a spiritual power. Care how many guns you have in your closet? They're ineffective against supernatural beings. Righteousness is effective. Salvation is effective. Truth is effective. The gospel is effective. Salvation is effective. Faith is effective. The word of God is effective. And it matters. Matters. So let's be aware. Let's be 
engage, let's stand our grounds, and let's see God glorified in this place, in those places, and in the end of the world. That's what we're doing. Strong in the Lord and the power of his might. (laughs) Know what he has done for you and walk in the protection he has provided.